Professor Pavlidis, Nick, thank you very much for giving us a couple of minutes at the ESMO meeting. It's very busy and I know you're uh, very, very busy. Um, you've long been an authority on a variety of issues in medical oncology. You're a key man in ESMO, you're involved in ESO, you do a lot of guidelines work and so on. And, and, and you do a lot of research. And one of the things you're very well known for is, uh, is research into uh, primary tumours of unknown origin. Where are you with that research? Where, what's the state of art at the moment? Well, actually, uh, first of all, let me thank you very much for this uh, uh, invitation. It's my pleasure and honour to be here mm -hmm. with you. Uh, exactly when we are talking about cancer of a non-primary, there are a uh, kind of research which covers the whole issue from the epidemiology yeah. to the detection to the treatment. So uh, if you want me just to try to help the audience uh, to bring up what are the major issues of cancer of a non-primary in all aspects of uh, this disease, I would say first of all epidemiologically. Uh, we as medical oncologists probably don't know that cancer of a non-primary is not an uncommon disease. Uh, cancer of a non-primary goes up to 5% of uh, the population of our patients in the hospitals. So it's not... So that's thousands yeah, across Europe, it's thousands. Not, it's not a rare disease, to be honest. And the second question is, uh, is there any difference in clinical behavior or natural history of this disease comparing to the known primaries? Mm. And the answer is yes, there are differences. There are different characteristics. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, cancer for non-primary is uh, most of the time it's an aggressive disease. They do not present with the primary tumor and they have a kind of unpredictable metastatic pattern. What do we mean by unpredictable metastatic pattern is, let's get an example, for example, cancer of the pancreas, pancreatic cancer. They don't give usually lung metastasis. They don't give usually bone metastasis. But if you deal with the hidden pancreatic cancer presenting as CAP, then uh, lung metastasis goes up to 30%. Wow. So this makes the whole clinical behavior completely different. Well, the third point is uh, how you investigate these patients in order to identify the primary tumor. And here we have three kind of algorithms. The first is histopathology with all the modern immunohistochemistry. Sure. It's just a confusing area. Also, you do the gene profiling nowadays. You have the imaging technology. You start from a simple chest X-ray and you go up to PET scan. And also you have endoscopies where most of the people try to to, to, to make their patients suffer by doing endoscopy everywhere, yeah. which is not... Top to bottom and yeah. bottom to top. And this is not important, this is not necessary. Okay. If you do not have signs or symptoms or some chest X-ray showing something, you don't have to go for, for bronchoscopy okay. or you go for colonoscopy all the time. And the fourth major issue is uh, how you treat these patients. Yeah. But before starting and coming to the treatment, we have to make clear what do we know about uh, cancer for non-primary as disease. Is it one disease or is more than one disease? And the answer is, of course, is it's more than one disease. And nowadays we split cancer for non-primary to the good prognosis ones and the bad prognosis ones. Based on? Uh, based on clinical pathological characteristics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have also to know that, uh, unfortunately, the good prognosis patients are only 20%. The majority of them belongs to the bad prognosis mm -hmm. patients. So our uh, effort is to try, as a step one, to identify exactly if we can detect the primary tumor. And what we do not want to lose is to have a patient with breast cancer or a germ cell tumor or a pnet tumor or a lymphoma and we miss that. We don't want to miss that. So we need a correct diagnosis. Because these are treatable yeah. and responsive to treatment. All right. And second thing is if you know where to put your patient, to categorize your patient, he does belong to the bad prognosis or the good prognosis. And if it is a good prognosis and we have several subsets there, we can treat them 
reasonably well. Like, uh, for example, patients with peritoneal carcinomatosis looks like an ovarian cancer. They have to be treated like ovarian cancer. Platinum, taxium. Yeah. They have the same results. Yeah. Patients, females, came with isolated axillary lymphadenopathy. It looks like a breast cancer stage 2. Yeah. So you have to treat them accordingly. As if. Yeah. Yeah. If you have neuroendocrine tumors, the same thing. Yeah. So these are the good prognosis patients. Yeah. You have to know how to treat them. Now, if you go to the bad prognosis tumors, then there, there is a big problem, how to treat them. And if you look at the guidelines, what the guidelines says, if you have a patient with a bad prognosis cap, and they are relatively young, with a good performance status, then please try a platinum combination treatment. One, two, three cycles and see how they behave. If they respond, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, if it is old patient, bad prognosis, poor prognosis, uh, as far as uh, performance status, then you can go for palliative treatment. Yeah. And these are the ESMO and every guideline says. Good stuff. Try to identify where your patient belongs. Sure. So, uh, cut down on the aggressive investigations. Yep. Uh, use all the clever tools in the path lab, the immunochemistry and the special stains and the genomic signatures. Then categorize into good versus bad. One in five are good and the rest are bad. The good ones you treat in the clinical category that they are clinically uh, suspected of. And the bad ones, platinum containing regime if they're fit and got a reasonable performance status, if not palliative care. Yep. Did I get that? Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. That's uh, really clear and I appreciate you giving you us your much. time. Thank, Thank you. you.